Well, hello and welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. This time we're getting a tech preview of Cluster FS um, and OpenShift. So I've invited two of the folks from the Red Hat Storage Group, Diane Saha and Michael Adam, to give us an update and um, an overview of Cluster and OpenShift. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves and kick it off because I hear they have a lot of content. So let's get going. Michael, Diane? Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. So, um, um, yeah, so we are here about uh, to talk about the um, ClusterFS or Cluster and OpenShift story. Um, um, Cheyenne, a few words about yourself, maybe? Yeah, so uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. So I run uh, product management for Red Hat Gluster Storage uh, in uh, in Red Hat, and then I'm also responsible for the Container Native Storage solution, which which runs containerized cluster inside OpenShift in a in a converged manner, uh, basically, um, you know, providing a solution where you can run storage containers uh, side by side with application containers. This is actually generally available today in form of a solution from Red Hat. So. Um, and I have other responsibilities in Red Hat regarding storage product management. I'll not go into those details. Michael, go ahead. Right, thank you. So um, yes, I'm part of the open uh, of, of the storage engineering team, and um, I'm working. I'm, I'm running the team that actually works on that so-called container native storage solution, which is the uh, solution that ties together Gluster and OpenShift, which we are going to talk about today. Um, and um, yeah, let's proceed and uh, we'll, we'll explain what this all is about. Oh, Say, if you could advance the slides, please. Right. Yeah. Can you see it? Yes. So this is uh, the rough agenda of uh, what we're going to cover. I'm going to talk about what actually is Gluster. Um, I'm going to talk about briefly uh, about the storage use cases in OpenShift. Um, then I'm going to describe the way to what we call container native storage and what it actually is. And then I'm going into the details how it all works. Finally, um, there's the roadmap thing. Um, if we have time inside the how it all works sections, we have two demos. Uh, but if we don't have time, they are recorded, they are available on YouTube even. So um, uh, if, we are, if we don't have the time, um, then we're going to skip those. And yes, uh, of course, questions are encouraged um, whenever something is unclear or people want more details. So uh, let's go on. Next slide, please. So we go on about Gluster. What actually is Gluster? Next slide, please. Oh, this is good. Um, yes, thanks. So uh, what is Gluster? Traditionally called Gluster FS. Uh, uh, nowadays, usually Gluster is a, a software-defined storage system, meaning we have a stack of software um, that implements uh, this storage solution. It's not tied to any hardware, it runs on most any hard uh, commodity hardware out there. Um, it is providing a scale out file storage, uh, scale out in the sense it's clustered, it's uh, running on multiple storage nodes on the same at the same time. But that is also highly available um, so that uh, it is not, I mean, required for each and every single host to be up. Uh, so certain downtimes of individual hosts are uh, well acceptable as long as enough of the other hosts are up. And uh, for such a scale out, highly available uh, storage system, it's fairly easy to set up and fairly easy to administer. So it is uh, not as complex uh, as many other um, scale out storage systems. Um, it is also, in all its simplicity, very flexible, offers a lot of additional nice features and um, um, it's very flexible in, in, in its configuration. Um, the, how, how, what does it offer by way of access methods? So there the native um, client is a Fuse-based uh, POSIX file system mount that is available on Linux or Linux uh, clients. Um, we have NAS heads like NFS and uh, SMB, so Samba offering the SMB protocol for typically Windows clients and a built-in NFS server and uh, a new um, uh, extra NFS server with the Ganesha NFS v4 and newer um, system. So this is sitting um, on top of Gluster basically, but we also, as new features, have um, 
uh, or are about to have in a very new um, release um, an iSCSI front end uh, based on loopback files sitting inside cluster storage. And we also have a object access by uh, so-called Gluster Swift front end, which also features a um, um, plugin for offering Amazon S3 object access. Um, so as you see, file is the native access, like really offering a scale-out file system, but block and object access is added on top of that. So that's roughly the the overview of uh, what Gluster is and what Gluster offers. And uh, on the next slide, I have a few more details about the community. So Gluster is an open source project. You can visit its home on gluster.org. Um, you can visit the GitHub uh, space with a lot of repositories with code and, and stuff surrounding it on github.com slash gluster. Um, and it's, uh, um, what is not written here, Red Hat ships this, this as part of the Red Hat Gluster Storage uh, product, RHGS. Um, but this is the upstream, the community-facing thing. Um, some more technical details about Gluster on the next slide. Thank you. So the basic concept of a um, volume is inside Gluster. So um, the volume is the unit of storage that Gluster offers. Um, these volumes are composed composed of local file system directories. So it's really very simple. You have local file system, like typically XFS, um, and these directories composing volume are called bricks. Um, these, vo these volumes can be composing of bricks in different types. They're volume types, uh, typically different um, characteristic of durability. Uh, we have replicate and distribute. Those can be combined to have a volume that is uh, um, Distributed, uh, distributing its storage over various so-called replica sets. Replica set is a group of bricks typically located on different nodes where you store something. It is uh, replicated to all, let's for instance say you have three replica, um, then it, one storing a file will replicate the contents to three bricks. Um, another characteristic is uh, the dispersed type of volume, which is an erasure coded uh, way of doing uh, volumes. And there are more, but these are for our purposes, uh, the most important ones. Um, I alluded to the flexibility um, and feature richness. Uh, this is mostly due to the architecture uh, of a stack of translators. So these translators are basically pluggable modules that can be stacked and um, a volume um, definition consists of a list of these translators. These translators add some features um, like, uh, I mean, some more of the in interesting high-level features are encrypted volumes. There's a snapshot feature. Um, Gluster even has the so-called user serviceable snapshots where the snapshots are visible inside the actual mounted uh, directory and you can very conveniently access your old versions of the files. Um, we have something called geo-replication. As I said, uh, Gluster is a clustered file system. But what if you have multiple clusters on different sites where with a, a link that is to, has too high latency in order to form a single cluster? Then there is something called geo-replication where data is replicated between these clusters in a asynchronous fashion. Um, quota is there, et cetera, et cetera. Many of these things, also more POSIX file system features like uh, POSIX echoes, et cetera, et cetera. So access control. All these things are available through translators and uh, also additional uh, daemons, daemons that are running. So uh, this is not a, a monolithic uh, software. It is called the whole cluster system um, consists of many um, daemons that are running on each of the storage nodes. We have a, so a cluster D, which is kind of the central cluster membership and volume management daemon. We have Bricks, brick servers for each brick. Uh, we have demons for quota and snapshots, etc. Um, so this is also very flexible and, and very um, robust in the sense when something bad happens, a disk dies or something, then there is um, uh, you can repair a volume, you can re-add new um, disks. There is uh, something called cell field, which will lead to um, automatic repa repairing of a um, failing disk um, when you add a substitute, et cetera, et cetera. So this is very feature rich. You can visit gluster.org and navigate to the documentation section there um, to read more about the details. Um, 
And with that, um, of course, any times when there are more questions, uh, we can come how come to the story how this uh, can go into the world of OpenShift and Kubernetes to um, be of great help there. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> next slide, please, Simon. Yeah, I've done it. it takes oh, yeah, it's, okay, <laughs> sure, it's there, thanks. So, um, so this was about storage. Um, uh, so what are the use cases for storage in OpenShift? Um, there are basically two main use cases. Um, there are application containers and there's the registry. Um, so for both points, I have a slide explaining a little bit what this means. So persistent storage for application containers is next. Next slide, please. Yes, thanks. So the containers in itself uh, have the paradigm of being stateless ephemeral animals, basically. So they can be brought up and down on in an OpenShift cluster on different nodes, and this uh, will actually be just instances of the same application container. Um, but if they're brought down and up again, any data they stored on their local disk have be, has been um, uh, removed. Um, it's reset to the original state. So the apps, they, usually they want to store um, their data somewhere persistently. So the state of the application, the user's data, the configuration of the application, all that needs to be stored and persistently. And for that, something like Luster, which is highly available, robust, scalable, uh, seems like a natural fit. So this is the first use case. Second, here's a question. Do you count the OSCP own parts like logging and metrics as applications? Um, this is currently not the main focus. The uh, okay. the own the own parts. I'll take that question. Uh, so so the Jesus. answer to that is yes. I mean, the way to look at it is we are chipping away at the problem one by one. So we understand that OpenShift um, has infrastructure which needs storage too. Uh, infrastructure includes things like registry, metrics with Cassandra and Hockular, and uh, logging with Elasticsearch. Um, so yes, those need storage too. We 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 are will do the registry first, and then we'll look at Cassandra and uh, um, and uh, Elasticsearch in a future release to see what we can do there. Uh, both Cassandra and Elasticsearch um, uh, recommend that uh, local storage be used with SSDs. You know that's their recommendation because they need really low latency local storage. But uh, we are looking at, we are we are making some improvements in Gluster. Um, to see if we can take those workloads too, uh, and that would be great. But we're starting with the registry. Right, exactly. So that seems to have answered the question. There was a thanks from Alex on the chat. So, right, the second natural use case would be the registry. Registry is also a place where data is stored persistently for access by, um, by many processes in the OpenShift cluster, namely the container images. It's the repository of the container images. Um, OpenShift uses NFS as a registry storage backend by default. Um, and this seems to be a very good fit for Gluster as well, because how is NFS usually done? You have local disks um, that are then exported as NFS um, exports. And so the kind of flexibility and high availability um, is not granted in the same level as with ClusterFS. So, um, I'll have some more details about how we're approaching this in one of the uh, later slides. There is another um, question here um, from Jonathan. Um, are you running NFS on top of Gluster, transparent to OpenShift, or does OpenShift know about Gluster as for this? This is a good question. I will cover the details in later slides. We are not running on top of NFS. We are doing it natively. And um, yes. And somebody uh, comments uh, they're using Cinder instead of NFS. Yes, yes of uh, course. I mean, yes. You could yeah. use all those abstractions, yeah. but uh, but we are using natively Gluster um, in this solution because that's the fastest and the most performant rather than going through abstractions. Sure. And if you have, uh, of course, an OpenStack environment, uh, Cinder may be a good and natural fit for uh, the registry, of course, as well. Um, that's right. 
So we'll cover a little bit more about the registry, but since registry is currently in under development, uh, and we are talking about uh, what we've done in the past first and uh, uh, what we currently ship in, and then we go into the roadmap. So this is uh, what I call towards container native storage. Um, the term will also be container native storage will also be defined as we move along. So next slide, please. Should see it. Yes, there it is. So we have had several several steps uh, of bringing Gluster and OpenShift closer together. The first um, term that was coined was called container ready storage. What did that mean? That basically meant when con container orchestration was added to OpenShift in th in three point one, um, there was the opportunity to have um, uh, yeah a Gluster storage cluster. Um, outside of the um, OpenShift cluster, um, for instance, installed in bare metal or wherever. I mean, with this, uh, and somehow your uh, screen is showing oh, some sorry. calendar. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, sorry about that, it's just a calendar, but you know, sure. should, uh, I killed my calendar instances. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. So um, the Reddit, uh, in this case, so the cluster storage uh, cluster runs outside of the OpenShift cluster somewhere on bare metal or wherever. Since it's a software-defined storage system, it basically can run anywhere. It can be in a, in a virtual environment or bare metal. And um, the OpenShift containers make use of the volumes that are provided by that external cluster storage. So um, there is some link from these containers to the outside storage world, and you have all the flexibility, um, but it's like a, gen a separate, um, separate setup. And that was step number one. Um, now please for step number two on the next slide. We called that, con yes, containerized storage, thank you. So we started um, to containerize Gluster into, so putting the cluster storage node into containers. That was not done before. As I explained earlier, cluster itself is a relatively complicated set of daemons. They need a lot of uh, special privileges since they add, uh, they act on local storage devices, et cetera, relatively low level system daemons. And so it was not entirely trivial to containerize those, um, but it was done and so, in the second intermediate step uh, called containerized storage, cluster was running in containers, but still outside of the OpenShift cluster. So, but this already indicates where we were going. And please, next slide. Yeah. Um, this is container native storage. Um, in this setup, cluster uh, runs inside containers in the OpenShift cluster itself. Um, that means the containers that were previously somewhere outside in some atomic host uh, setup were now running inside OpenShift and managed by OpenShift basically. And so <clears throat> it is using local disks from the um, hosts that are consumed inside the open uh, inside the cluster storage containers. And the cluster is really running, as we say, hype converged inside the OpenShift node. And the application parts that are consuming those uh, cluster volumes, they can either run on separate OpenShift nodes or they can run um, on the same nodes. They can, but must don't have to be co-located. This is also demonstrated in this um, in this picture here. You see, there's an OpenShift node one which only runs application containers. OpenShift node two and three they run both storage and application containers and OpenShift Node 4 exclusively runs storage containers. So all three combinations are possible and they're possible on the same um, cluster. So it's entirely up to the administrator how to set this all up. Um, sometimes resource-wise, it may make sense to have it entirely separate. Thank you. Yes, and so this is the general what we are doing. Um, it's fine, we can move on and explain in a little more detail how this all works because there are many nitty-gritty details about that. Um, okay, next slide. Thank you. So we have a couple of components coming into the picture here. Um, I already mentioned, of course, I talked about OpenShift or Kubernetes uh, in the back end. Um, 
we, I talked about cluster or cluster of S um, clusters that are providing the storage, um, but that's basically not all. So how does OpenShift actually talk to cluster? How does it make the connection? Um, it does so by some components that we added to OpenShift or to Kubernetes, which is the on the one side the, the, the dynamic or at all the cluster of S provisioner, which is the piece that um, creates the so-called persistent volumes. Um, to be used by the application containers. And we have the mount plugin that is responsible for actually doing the mounting um, so that the application container can use the storage that the provisioner created for it. Um, ClusterFS, as I said, yes, one or more ClusterFS clusters running inside OpenShift in, as containers. Um, but OpenShift does not directly talk to them, but we have in the middle between the two, we have a service interface um, that is called Heketi. This is also running as a container, um, and it is just a very high-level interface to hide a lot of the low-level details of cluster and makes it very easy. Um, it offers a RESTful API uh, so that uh, cluster, uh, Kubernetes or OpenShift can na naturally talk to it. And um, it then turns around and um, looks for available space in cluster and creates volumes uh, according to the um, requested size, et cetera. Um, the fourth component uh, that is also in the mix is the deployment. So uh, this will be the last part of the overview of what we currently have. I mean, the first three components describe an installed system and how this all works. The last thing is how do we install something like that? And so there's a deployment tool, which is basically one command and uh, it will install everything for you. Um, this would be touched last. So let's first of all moving from OpenShift Kubernetes down into the cluster world through the components and explain a little more in detail how this all works. Um, so uh, how does persistent storage in OpenShift today work? This is just a brief recap, assuming that uh, most of the audience will be familiar with that. So. Um, when I'm talking about a pod, this is the group of one or more containers that form an entity, basically the smallest entity of uh, applications that we have. A persistent volume um, is the concept that provides persistent storage and can be mounted by an application pod. Um, a provisioner, as already mentioned, provides persistent volumes upon request. And uh, the plugin, the mount plugin, is the mechanism that mounts the persistent volumes um, and uh, it is referenced in the PV. So the PV, the persistent volume, carries the knowledge how it can be mounted. Um, a persistent volume claim, or PVC, is the mechanism by which a user can request a persistent volume to be created. It is also the link by which the user can later um, use that volume in an application container to be mounted. Um, there are various access types for volumes. Um, I, I have uh, listed the acronyms and all sort of spellings out. So read, RWO, read write once, um, RWX, read write many, ROX, read one only many. Um, so uh, this is very important. Um, so the typical thing we are currently targeting for or concentrating on is the RWX, read write many. So there is one volume. Um, and a lot of uh, application parts on multiple nodes can access that volume simultaneously. Imagine a web application and you have the, the data with the persistently stored data for the websites and the web server um, has these parts, they are accessing the same data and this can scale out. Um, you can spawn more of them, um, of these web server parts, they all access the same data and serve it out to the um, clients. Um, for read write once, I have uh, some more details. It's also supported, but there is uh, some special uh, thing on the roadmap for that. Um, and yes, the, of that uh, provisioning, there's actually static and dynamic provisioning. Um, all right, so um, now in order to be able to appreciate the dynamic provisioning, here is what static provisioning is. This was uh, the only way to provision persistent volumes before OpenShift 3.4. So the admin had to pre-create a set of persistent volumes and the static provisioner 
uh, gets a request for a certain size and then chooses from the existing persistent volumes based on the type and size for, from the claim. And it just chooses, uh, tries to best approximate from above the size requested. So that means if the admin has pre-created like a couple of 100 gigabyte volumes and then it gets requests for one gigabyte volumes, a lot of space is wasted. Um, and so this is, uh, it has more work that, can, that has to be done and uh, it is uh, likely wasting space. So on the next slides, I have just a few like screenshots to see, okay, what is the workflow of commands for static provisioning? Um, first, you have to create some endpoints and service. Um, I don't go into the details here for application parts to be able to reach your um, storage provider cluster in this case. Um, um, and then in the case of cluster, uh, you, I use the Hecate CLI, the Hecate command line interface in order to pre-create, for instance, 100 gigabyte uh, persistent volumes. Uh, these would be a lot of those. And um, uh, on top of that, we'd need to create um, OpenShift level persistent volumes with OC create with some kind of JSON file describing the persistent volume here. And um, an application part could then uh, uh, so, or a user could create a persistent volume claim. So from here, it's easy. It would uh, get the persistent volume and could use it in an application. But the tedious part is the manual pre-creation. So you would go to the storage backend and create the volumes, and then you would create a lot of these persistent volumes manually. Um, So here is the question, as I understood in the past, you will need one cluster endpoint per persistent volume. Is this still the case? Um, yes, this is also in the in the later, in the dynamic provision, right? Um, is, this is very much true. Um, we'll see that a little later. So for the static provisioner, here's an example how the PVC would look like. You see that, uh, yeah, we have a name <clears throat> and uh, you just specify a, um, a request here and then uh, it can be satisfied. So this from here and for the end user, this is very simple, Not, nothing complicated here. So please proceed and we can talk about how dynamic provisioning works. So it was added in 3.4 and how this works in general is a storage class concept is added and um, the administrator creates the storage class uh, this describes the storage basically in a high level, and it references a dynamic provisioner. Um, you'll see that in the example um, in one of the next slides. And so the difference now is the persistent volume claim that is done by the user, it references the storage class. And the provisioner from that storage class is automatically called. It creates the persistent volume of requested size and type, etc. Um, dynamically on demand. So there's no pre-creation. That whole thing is going away and the user can just mount the PVC, a PV or re reference the PVC after it's bound in an application pod just like before. The main point is um, no pre-creation required and um, the, the requested size will be fulfilled exactly and not approximated, maybe poorly. Um, so please proceed. So how does that work with the dynamic provisioner? So I don't only have it in the flow of uh, bullets from left to right and back again. Um, apologies for not having a real diagram, but this is how it goes. Um, as I said, the persistent volume claim references the, yeah, basically the storage class and implicitly thereby the ClusterFS provisioner. It is called the ClusterFS provisioner, extracts the details of the request from the persistent volume claim it tells, it goes out to Hecate and tells it to create a certain volume of a given size and type. Hecate looks for a cluster cluster that can satisfy the request. So it looks for a cluster that has enough storage available. If it finds one, so there can be multiple of them, then Hecate tells the cluster instance to create the volume. Once that is successfully done, cluster reports back and Hecate um, hence the volume that was created back to the provisioner. The provisioner creates a persistent volume of that and puts the cluster volume details into it, so how to reach it, etc. It also uh, referenced the cluster FS mount plugin to be used for mounting that. 
and um, the provision of them returns the persistent volume to the caller. The, um, upon success, the persistent volume claim is bound to this newly created persistent volume and then can later be used in a part by the user as before. So this is how it works from left to right. PVC to the provision inside Kubernetes to Hecate. Hecate finds a cluster cluster that is fitting. It calls that, uh, creates the volume there, and bum, 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 goes back all the way. So this is how all the components work together. Thanks. Thanks, you. So here is an example of a storage class. Um, and you see um, the provisioner colon kubernetes.io slash clusterfs. This is the reference uh, that tells it that this is to be used. Um, <clears throat> so, and also um, in the parameters, there are the details how to reach um, the, the Hecate. Um, in this case, oh, this is basically, even in, there's an error here, this shouldn't be 127001. It should be a real resolvable name that leads to the uh, Hecate pod, wherever it's running currently, because it can move in the cluster. So, um, but in general, this is the main point here is we have the provisioner named in the storage class, and we have uh, uh, how to reach the Hecate inside uh, the parameters. And you need notice the name of the storage class. In this case, it's called cluster container. I mean, you can give any name, it should just be unique. And so on the next slide, we'll see how this is used um, in a PVC, persistent volume claim. So here's the PVC. Um, it again has a name and, uh, and the annotations in the first block, we see um, storage class, cluster container. So that cluster container in this case was the name of the storage class. What I have given there, if you reference it here, this will, um, um, let the OC create when you run it with this claim, it will let it know that it has to go out to the cluster FS uh, provisioner with the uh, data down here. For instance, we have access mode read write once, we have storage uh, for gigabyte, and it will try and create exactly a volume of this size. Um, next slide, please. Another example of how this thing is used in an application um, definition. So we had the name of claim one. And right down, we have in the persistent volume claim, claim one. So um, creating this app will only work um, after the PVC has successfully been processed and has been bound to, uh, to the created persistent volume. Um, so this is, this is not changed. Um, there's a question, how is resize working? Um, increased by five gigabyte, uh, reduced by two gigabyte, et cetera. So, um, technically, Hecate can be used to do that. Um, uh, expansion, at least. Uh, we are working on adding more features like shrinking, etc. Expansion is um, is available in Hecate, um, whether it's fully supported, at least in like uh, Red Hat product is another thing. But uh, technically, it is there. Yes, Hecate CLI. Um, has a lot of um, these things. I think, to my knowledge, is not able to trigger that with with, um, with OC commands currently. But you can still work on the volume with, uh, with the Hecate command line. Okay, uh, let's move on. Thanks. So again, to, in order to be able to compare to the previous uh, static provisioner, I have here the flow of commands for the dynamic provisioner. Of course, you first have to create the storage class. Um, and then um, also you need the, the secret here um, for accessing the Hecate. But uh, then uh, all the intermediate steps, they are missing. Like you don't need to pre-create the Hecate vol the whole volumes with Hecate and the persistent volumes with OC create, but then you run um, just as before the cluster, the OC create on the persistent volume claim, but this time referencing our storage class, and then it works uh, exactly the same way just from there. Um, and um, I don't have all the uh, screenshots here for that now, but you'll see that this dynamic provisioner will always, for each persistent volume claim, 
uh, persistent one that is successfully created, it will create endpoint and servers. Because um, this will this is important, so even though maybe each time the same cluster cluster is referenced, these are also tied to the namespaces of a request, and so hence we need additional um, endpoint and service here. Um, right. Cheyenne comments that Kubernetes does not support resize operation yet, hence you have to use the Hecate in a future version, this will likely be integrated. So, what does the mount plugin do? Um, the OpenShift host has GlusterFS client installed, so it is not imposing any um, request or any requirement on the application parts. The host mounts the GlusterFS volume and then bind mounts it into the application container. So for the container, it will just see some directory which presents a file system, a POSIX file system to him, and um, all the magic is happening on the host. This is how the GlusterFS mount plugin works in simple words. All right. So, um, next slide, please. Let me see. Um, we are 20 minutes uh, before yeah. the end of the meeting. I think we should move on. And if we have time at the end, we will have a demo. I think we have probably sufficiently explained how it works in principle. And uh, the, the slides, which uh, can be shared later, uh, contain the link for the demo, which can be watched later. Is that okay? Yeah, that's perfect. Um, there's one question there I don't think that Cyan has, has answered. Um, Jonathan's asking, what does the secret look like? This is just credential uh -huh. for your cluster FS servers? It's actually credential um, also. I mean, this is for, for accessing the Hecate uh, service, basically. Did that answer your question, Jonathan? And it can be of various forms. I mean, it's the concept of um, of OpenShift or Kubernetes secrets here. Um, so it can be a password or something else. Okay. Um, okay. Then we, let's move on and uh, defer the demos to the end until we have, if you have time. So a little bit more detail about Hecate. I mentioned a little bit of it. Um, so it is a high-level service interface. Um, for managing life, life cycle of cluster volumes in the sense it can create it, it can expand it, and it can delete the volumes. It is also providing this RESTful API and a command line interface um, to access these features. So Kubernetes will, when creating a persistent volume, um, the cluster was provisioner will talk to Akati via the RESTful API. And for any additional stuff that is not exposed via, that, uh, via Kubernetes or OpenShift, uh, you can use the Hecate CLI from some, for instance, if on a master node you install the Hecate CLI um, package, then you will be able to use that. Um, the main point is it manages one or several cluster clusters. Um, um, yeah, what it can do, I've already said, more is coming, that's right, shrinking, replacing disks, et cetera, like that is going to, is in the working. Um, one of the main points is, is that really highs the nitty gritty details of volume creation and cluster selection from the caller. So um, usually you have to specify each and every single um, brick, i.e. disks, etc., et um, and the volume type, etc. So the creation in um, cluster uh, is some amount of um, command line. And um, for a cat, you just say, hey, I need a five gigabyte volume. By default, it uses replica three volumes, and it can also, uh, upon request, do other types of volumes. Currently, um, Kubernetes always requests replica three. Uh, in the future, we are um, going to offer other types as well, exposed through the storage class, uh, but, but this is how it currently works. Um, as I said, just text size and durability type, and uh, it finds a cluster with enough disk space to satisfy the requests, goes there, creates it, and uh, yeah. In order to do all that, it has its own state stored in the database. Um, that is one thing to be aware of. This database maintains state about the nodes and all the clusters, and also about the volumes and the disks. So um, this is very important uh, to bear in mind. Um, I also put in the link here, um, as the other components, this is all open source software. Um, here's its home on github.com slash Hecate slash Hecate. By the way, Hecate um, 
you may wonder what, what the heck that name means. Um, it is the word for one in the native Puerto Rican uh, language, because the original author, author of uh, the software was uh, originating from um, Puerto Rico. So this is uh, the origin, like uh, a fun fact about this software. Um, let me see, there is a question or two. Ah, already answered. What I think uh, I understand is that you might run the cluster plus two outside of OpenShift, then the hosts will map the remote volumes locally. Is that recommended approach here? Um, yeah, you can, you can do it. You can run it outside and you can run it inside. In both cases, Hecate will run as a container. Um, right, so the Hecate container uh, is much less special than the cluster containers. I told you earlier that cluster was not uh, trivial to containerize. There's a lot of things. It's even running today as a privileged container, accessing the um, disks and network from the host, etc. Um, Hecate is much less special. It is a single container. It's not clustered. It's not highly available. It, it can move in the cluster. Um, Kubernetes or OpenShift will place it for you. Um, the main point is that its database needs to be persisted in order that the state is not for, um, lost. So this is uh, currently stored in the cluster volume. In the next releases, uh, there will be um, another storage uh, place, but currently this is how we're doing it. There is this kind of chicken and egg thing where we already create a cluster volume and then put our database inside that. Um, and the database is also the reason why you have to be very careful um, you should only use Hecate to modify your volumes and you should not fiddle with cluster directly. Um, more questions? To run inside your hosts need brick drives is one comment by Jonathan. Uh, Shine says yes and no, you could load up some of the hosts with big drives and run cluster container only on those nodes. That's right. And uh, how big the drives need to be, of course, depends very much um, on how much storage uh, you are expecting to need. So for many use cases, a few terabytes may even be sufficient. Um, so here is, a, is the warning sign again, right? Don't mess with the volumes manually. Manually meaning using going into the cluster containers or cluster nodes and running the cluster commands to modify the volumes. That should really be not, not be done. Use Hecate or Hecate's own state may get disturbed. So this warning sign, so we are wait, working on in the future, being able to remove that warning sign to, to more tightly integrate Hecate Hecate's state with cluster itself, but currently this is what it is. So the warning um, needs to be done. Um, so we can move on, please. So the next point is, now that we've described how this all works, um, how to get to such a system, um, be it with cluster outside or cluster inside OpenShift. Um, so for these purposes, we created a tool um, the upstream version of this, like the upstream project on GitHub, is under the cluster uh, organization currently. It's called Cluster Kubernetes. Um, and the tool that uh, does the deployment for us is called GK Deploy, like Cluster Kubernetes Deploy. Um, but it's also capable of running in an OpenShift world using OC commands in, instead of kube control. And um, uh, in the Red Hat products, we ship it as CNS Deploy. CNS being the acronym of Container Native Storage, um, which we kind of hook up on the OpenShift releases. So you see that I'm talking about CNS 3.4, which is uh, more or less a synonym for OpenShift 3.4 in this respect. So there's a lot to do, right? I mean, we need to install the Luster cluster um, or, or more of them. We need to uh, install Hecate. We need to tell Hecate about um, all the disks and nodes. Um, and the, all this needs to be deployed and appropriately configured. Um, so this is what, ha what is happening. This tool takes a topology file, the so-called topology file, as an input. The topology file has the uh, details about um, um, the node IP addresses, the names, uh, the disk devices in each node, et cetera, et cetera. It takes that and it creates um, in Hecate pod, it creates, if told so, it is uh, optional. It also creates the cluster pods. Um, if it does that, it, it uses uh, a daemon set to set up the cluster, the cluster clusters. 
and then um, it creates and deploys the Hecate pod and then has Hecate load the topology file and do all the necessary steps of the setting up of the actual cluster. So the deployment of the cluster nodes is just the nodes. The software is there, the disks are there, and then Hecate goes and um, joins these cluster nodes into clusters, into so-called so trusted storage pools, and it also uh, teaches, uh, puts or initializes its own database with the knowledge of all these disks associated there. Um, and, and after this script has run, um, or this tool has run uh, successfully, you will be immediately be able to create appropriate storage classes and do PVCs. Um, there are a couple of prerequisites to fulfill uh, regarding firewall rules and stuff like that. Uh, I have not put all the nitty-gritty details in here, but the deployment tool will tell you about them. In the future, uh, the next version will even be able to um, check these prerequisites and also potentially satisfy some of them automatically. Um, there are more questions, but Humble is already answering them. That's good. So let me just read the questions uh, for the um, audience. Um, where will the cluster endpoints be set up? In the persistent volume claim namespace, exactly. How, get, how does the user developer get the endpoint for this PVC? Um, Oh, there's a lot of uh, stuff going on. Um, maybe let's continue uh, with a few slides because time is running short and maybe I can read some selected questions uh, later on because the discussion seems to be uh, referring to some earlier points. Yeah. Like the demo of the um, dynamic provisioning, let's defer the deployment demo to the end if there is more time left and let's advance. We can also answer these um, questions in the um, blog post that I'll put up. Um, okay. So just, just so everybody knows. It sounds good, thank you. So uh, as the next slide, we have a little bit about the roadmap. So um, continue, please. Um, we, I've told you what is available in, uh, in OpenShift 3.4, which is, Cluster of as is a provision and mount plugin satisfying persistent volume claim um, and dynamically creating the according volumes. It is uh, possible to use that for all types of access. Um, um, and you can, if you know how to do it, in theory also use Cluster of as a registry backend, but uh, in 3.5 for the first time, uh, document that officially and uh, have the um, a reference process for doing that. Um, we are also working towards improved uh, what we call day-to-day -day maintenance operations, like shrinking a volume by removing a disk, replacing a disk with a bigger disk or different disks, uh, and uh, without a downtime. <clears throat> and um, this is what we are working towards in the very, very soon release of 3.5. For um, 3.6, there is some uh, bigger change coming on, namely, as I said, uh, all access types are access nodes are supported, including read write ones. So the read write ones access type uh, is actually defined as um, not as one might expect access from a single container or pod, but access only from pods from a single node. Um, <clears throat> typically, this is in many cases, though, used as uh, access from a single container, like exclusive access. Um, and this, uh, these applications requesting exclusive access for some persistent volume, they usually expect a certain um, performance guarantees. Like for instance, the, the things alluded to earlier in some question, like logging and so on, um, Shine mentioned the Cassandra, et cetera, all stuff like that. And I mean, just plain databases. Uh, where there some um, application is exclusively accessing this, they usually have very high performance demands, um, and the cluster of S plug uh, cluster of S file mount, um, they usually have some difficulty satisfying those. You have to know um, that I mean, and this is true for each and every single um, scale out distributed uh, file system. Uh, this is, of course, never as fast as a local file system because um, many of the operations, especially the metadata operations, have to be coordinated in the whole cluster. Um, and this is much more expensive than just going to a local disk. So 
um, creating files, locking parts of a file and stuff like that. All this is very expensive and uh, um, it takes time. And if some application has uh, needs for some latency here, uh, they may not be fulfilled. I mean, you can always try. It's not, it's, it's supported, but uh, it may not be satisfactory. So for 3.6, we have on the roadmap um, improved support for these special read write one scenarios with the so-called cluster block provisioner. Um, so what's going on here uh, is this. We are going to offer an iSCSI type of volume from Gluster, and this is going to be mounted on the host, and then again, I mean, formatted and mounted on the host, on the OpenShift host, and then mounted into the container with bind mount, just like the Gluster volume. So the, the interesting point is that this will also be hosted by Gluster, and it will also be able to be dynamically provisioned. So we'll have dynamically provisioned volumes, which in the back end are implemented as some kind of block transport. Um, but this is completely transparent for the application. The application will um, request read write one's volume from a certain uh, provisioner, and it will get this. And um, uh, this is going to be, uh, this is planned for the summer release of 3.6. And for future, versions uh, 3.7 and later we have some more things on the roadmap here um, one thing is object access i mentioned that s3 based object access uh, on top of cluster volumes file volumes in its case is uh, is available um, and we are planning to implement that so that applications who don't want to use file mounts but want to have some object storage um, for some put and get operations, uh, or even, uh, as, as the second bullet point says, um, even the registry may be a perfect fit for some object uh, interface, improve backend uh, support uh, for the registry is the second bullet point. So these are the very high level um, objectives for the future. And so 3.7 is roughly planned for autumn. So from autumn and a little later, uh, you can expect those uh, features. Um, then generally, I mean, the improved day-to-day -day maintenance operations, they are going to continue over the next couple of releases. Um, the feature set will be much more complete. And we are working on the scalability. So one thing that has not been mentioned explicitly yet is scalability is uh, not yet optimal with Cluster. Uh, it has a certain amount of memory requirements. Um, and there is currently a limit of roughly uh, 100, 150 volumes per cluster cluster at maximum. In the next release of 3.5, this will already be improved. Later, it will be improved very greatly so that uh, it will be possible to host um, many hundreds to maybe even thousand or a few thousand volumes on a single cluster cluster. Um, but currently, we are, are a little bit limited here, like um, typically 100 to 150 volumes uh, per cluster. And you need a good amount of memory, like 32 gigabyte for the storage container to host this number of volumes. Um, so these are the limitations, but we are working on improving them. As I said, 3.5 will already be improved to some extent. Two to 300 volumes likely uh, will be possible, and the 3.6 timeline will have um, <clears throat> probably a factor of five to ten um, uh, that we can um, add to the number of volumes that we can host. So. This is roughly the uh, roadmap for the next uh, year or so. And uh, with that, um, I think we can conclude the presentation and move on to the last slide, which is basically uh, some pointers. Um, <clears throat> you can also see the, the links in the previous uh, slides where I put out the communities of uh, of Cluster, of Hecate, of Cluster Kubernetes. All those have uh, GitHub presences and many uh, of the things are um, present in Slack or on IRC, on Freenode, et cetera. So you have both the upstream and the downstream um, contacts here, basically. This has been really good and it, it is a, a was a ton of information. And um, I know we didn't get to the demos and there's a few people commenting here. Can we bring you guys back to do more demos another time because they'd like to see it in action? Um, you know, really, it, it, people just thanks very much for coming and doing this today. Uh, we only keep these things to an hour. Um, sure. Um, when 3.5 comes out, let's schedule another session with you guys and maybe to do, we'll add the links to the videos into the, um, the blog post that should go up on Monday. Um, mm -hmm. And 
we'll reschedule another session to do some live demos so that people can ask questions during the demos too. Uh, yeah, D absolutely. Diane, I think. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go. go. Um, I think what what we should do is after 3.5 comes out, we'll actually be using container native storage, which is Gluster running inside OpenShift to back the OpenShift registry. Mm -hmm. We can probably do a demo for that, plus the demos that we missed today. So, you know, so and um, so that would be a nice session to do, you know, in, in April, mid-April or you know, yeah. in May, whenever uh, we can schedule this. That I will definitely um, hit you up right after this talk and we'll, we'll put some pencil something in in the calendar. I'll also capture all of the questions here and send them to you guys so that maybe you can write little responses and I can include them into the um, Thanks again, guys, for, for doing this. Um, I, I've been asking for it for a while, and I know that it's been a moving target, but I'm really appreciative of you taking the time today and being here for us. So thanks again. Thanks for having us.